Well, welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, for this webinar with Richard Heinberg. My name is Michael Lerner, and um, Richard, welcome back to our ongoing series of conversations. Uh, yes, this one you, is a collaborative conversation uh, between uh, the Omega uh, 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 Funders uh, for Resilience work and the Post Carbon Institute and the Resilience Project at Commonweal, the New School, the Millennial Alliance for Humanity and the Biosphere and the FAN Initiative. So uh, it's a little consortium of us that have joined together to, um, to welcome you. Richard Heinberg is a, uh, a senior fellow in residence at the Post Carbon Institute. He's the author of about a dozen different books. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the Post Carbon Institute and its uh, website resilience.org uh, are one of the true class acts in the United States and around the world on the issues of the global challenge. And um, Richard as um, is in, in my perspective one of the, the, uh, the great intellectual forces uh, working in this field today. So Richard, it's a great pleasure to have you with us and uh, uh, we'd love to hear your presentation. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thanks for that very kind introduction. So um, uh, what I wanna do over the next 40 minutes is uh, talk first about sort of the, the, the context for what's happening right now that's got everyone's attention, which of course is the, the, the global pandemic. Um, uh, I, I do want to spend at least half of, of my time talking about that, but, uh, but I think the context is really important because uh, I think in most people's minds, you know, everything is fine. We're just sailing on and suddenly we're hit by this, this bolt out of the blue and, um, and uh, suddenly normal life is over and we, we have to uh, get this thing over with so we can return to how things are supposed to be. But of course, it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, our, our normal situation that we've been living through for the past, um, <coughs> uh, well, <laughs> since the beginning of industrial civiliza civilization, certainly, but especially during the last century, century or so, um, has been completely anomalous in all of world history and um, completely unsustainable. So what I want to do is, is help, you know, offer some ways of maybe thinking about why that's the case, how all of this happened. Uh, and what I'll be saying is based on a, uh, a book I've just finished, which isn't published yet and probably won't be for a few months but it informs all of my thinking and, um, and hopefully it can provide a frame for, for your thinking too. There's nothing in this particular slide that's, uh, uh, you know, especially germane to our thinking except just to say, yeah, climate change is a big deal and it's there. And uh, the same thing with not only loss of biodiversity, but just the, uh, the destruction of the of the natural world. I mean, it's not just that we're seeing fewer species out there. Uh, the, the the total biomass of non and uh, non cattle and <laughs> other uh, you know um, domesticated species uh, is declining dramatically. Um, we're basically killing off nature so that we have more space. For, for human beings. And that's not all that's going on. All these other things are, are happening at the same time. So um, again, you know, I think it's helpful to have some way of uh, contextualizing, thinking about all of these things. Um, and it's, it's a story that you can tell, you know, in, in five minutes or five hours or, or more, I'm going to try and do it in 10 minutes or so. Um, the book that I mentioned is, is about power because I think all of these things that, that are going on do have some uh, 
some commonalities, and one of them is that they're they're related to power. Power is you know it's really everything. We without power we can't do anything, and uh, and the pursuit of more power is is essentially what's gotten us into this mess. Not that the pursuit of power in and of itself is bad, unless power itself is bad, and it's not. Power is just the ability to do things. You know, uh, all living things have powers of various kinds, the power of movement, the power of um, the power of digestion or whatever. Um, but in addition to physical power, we humans have also introduced social power, which can be defined as the ability to get other people to do something. And the two kinds of social power, horizontal social power is, is like, well, we can do this thing together. Whereas vertical social power is um, you do this or else, or I'll pay you to do this. Um, as I say, uh, power is uh, present throughout nature. It's not just something that happens in human affairs. Uh, and evolution has, has proceeded according to what's called the maximum power principle, uh, which... Uh, Howard Odom and others uh, pioneered during the 20th century, understanding that uh, systems, uh, na all natural systems develop, including organ organisms, to maximize their power intake and those uses of power that reinforce production and efficiency. So how did we do that? Uh, well, starting in the Pleistocene, we humans differentiated ourselves from uh, other great apes by our development of uh, tools, our harnessing of fire, uh, starting to wear clothes so we could take over new e ecosystems. Uh, language was a huge shift. I think probably it was it was really the key to almost everything else. Now you could argue that we developed language because we were sitting around fires and spending a lot of time in close proximity, maybe that's true. But certainly we wouldn't have been able to make the kinds of complex tools that we have, uh, have been making for a few tens of thousands of years if we didn't have language so that we could pass, pass on the, these processes verbally from, from one person to another, one generation to another. Um, the power of beauty in art is something I emphasize a lot in the book because uh, it's an obsession, not just of human beings, but of all higher animals. Uh, birds especially spend a lot of time singing and dancing. And um, the assumption has been that this is all, all about sexual selection, which I think initially is certainly true. Uh, but uh, art and beauty take on a priority of, of, of their own apart from sexual selection. Uh, birds sing just to have fun. And, you know, I know a lot of young men who pick up a Stratocaster and learn how to play guitar in order to impress the girls. But that's, that's no explanation for why uh, we, many of us spend, you know, tens of thousands of hours trying to perfect you know, playing the violin as I do, or paint, or uh, do poetry, or 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 martial arts, or sports, or all of these things that are all, really all about uh, beauty and artistry and and spirituality, if you will, that really have nothing to do with sexual selection. So there's a there's an enormous power there that I think we'll need to tap into more and more as we turn away from the kinds of power that have become more toxic. It was in the, the Holocene period, the last 10,000 years, that uh, inequality really became a factor in, in human affairs. Prior to that, we were all living by hunting and gathering, and, and uh, gender inequality was fairly, uh, fairly minimal. Uh, uh, nobody could lord it over anybody else because uh, we lived in small bands that were entirely cooperative, and uh, if anybody got too um, <clears throat> uppity, then the, the tendency was for everybody else just to ostracize them or 
um, do a little capital punishment. And that was, that was part of how we, we probably evolved to be more cooperative. People who were extremely uncooperative just got eliminated from the gene pool. Um, religion in the sense of uh, uh, the, the big God religions that, uh, that implant a little watcher in our heads that, uh, that supervise our, our moral behavior this is something pretty new in, in uh, human history that started at, with the Axial Age, roughly 2,500 years ago. Uh, hunter-gatherer spirituality had nothing to do with moral behavior. It was, it was all about uh, contacting the powers of the nature spirits. Um, the, uh, the development of money, which is really storable, transferable, uh, quantifiable social power, Got, got its start in, in the Holocene with the uh, early states. Um, and we begin to see the real pathologies of power that we're all familiar with uh, today, which um, I don't have to rehearse them with you. We all, uh, we all know how power becomes a kind of drug, like, like heroin or methamphetamine, where Many people uh, become power addicts and, and closely guard their power and, uh, and use it in, in perverse ways. Um, a useful concept along the way that I want to make sure we all have is the idea of the adaptive cycle. This is something that was pioneered by um, resilience practitioners in the field of ecology. Uh, in an effort to understand the um, the response of ecosystems to disruption, so uh, when when there is a disruption in ecos in an ecosystem, uh, well, that's that leads to uh, a period of recovery, reorganization, and then uh, growth and and greater exploitation of the resources of that ecosystem. Uh, the the uh, climax species appear and we have a conservation phase where the resources are being used at a maximum rate. But actually the resilience of the ecosystem has, has declined because it's all at a um, uh, highest a state of highest possible exploitation. And then something comes along and uh, maybe it's a forest fire or a storm or a disease organism or something. And we have a, a collapse or release phase which starts the cycle over again. So this is perfectly natural. It happens in every ecosystem, it happens in human societies. And the reason I'm introducing this concept now is that once we had complex society, state societies based on agriculture with money and, and so on, uh, we started having uh, m uh, more pronounced uh, cycles of growth and collapse within human societies. And of course, there's been a lot of work in recent years on societal collapse and uh, looking at the history of why that's happened, how it's happened, when it's happened. Uh, Peter Turchin is a a key author in this, along with several others, and um, we could talk about uh, resources later on for some of these. I uh, also want to talk about power, physical power and social power. Big point in the book is that these are linked. We, often we just think either in terms of, of physical power, you know, uh, scientists, uh, physical scientists, I should say, think in terms of uh, power in terms of the, the rate of transferring energy. So the watt is a measure of physical power. Well, how do we measure social power? Well, you can measure social power in a lot of different ways by how much money somebody has, how many, how many votes they get in an election, uh, how many likes on Facebook, you know, I mean, you could go on and on. Social power is, is, um, is a little squishier than physical power. But the point I want to make is that as we have increased our physical power, the tendency has been for social power to become more, more unequal. Um, and this is a process we see through 
through history in fits and starts. It's not a, it's not just a, a, a perfect one-to-one -one correlation, but, but it's a, a more general correlation. So here's a mouse, a horse, elephant. How do these compare with a human being? Well, uh, a theoretical primate the size of a human without fire, about 110 watts. That's, uh, that's our basic biological uh, metabolism. A hunter-gatherer with fire and some tools can manage a lifestyle of about 476 watts. Uh, uh, a farmer planting crops and with a plow and an oxen, maybe 700 watts. You get to a modern industrial human in a poor country like India, more like 800 watts, and a modern industrial human in the U.S., more like 10,000 watts. So that's two orders of magnitude over what we're, uh, the amount of power we can wield just as you know, biological organisms with a metabolism. And we're even uh, you know, five times the, the power of, uh, of an elephant. Uh, and the super organism is basically the whole global economy at its current size. Because we have, in effect, become, we are, we are an ultra-social organism, even more social than something like ants or termites. And, uh, and so all of humanity makes up a kind of collective organism at this point that's, uh, that's wielding something like uh, 2 to times 10 to the 13th watts, which is, well, that's a lot of power. <laughs> How can we do that? Because of... of what's happened in over the course of the Anthropocene, which I would, in, in my own thinking, I start with the, uh, the fossil fuel era. I know there, there are some geologists who would, who would push that back to the beginning of the Holocene or possibly even back to the first use of fire by humans. But, you know, if you look at the scale of things, it's really the last couple of hundred years, all the trends that um, we talked about earlier have gotten started. Um, climate change, uh, uh, loss of biodiversity, and all, all the rest. Uh, everything is energy or power. I mean, power and energy are closely, closely related. Uh, and so as we began to use first coal and then oil, uh, everything, everything changed. Um, and uh, I would argue that all of these uh, problems that we see converging are problems of power we have uh, we have we are using so much power as human beings that we are overwhelming natural systems um, <clears throat> power in the sense of our ability to extract resources our ability to manufacture goods and transport them our ability to dump wastes into the atmosphere into water and everywhere else our ability to uh, increase our own numbers, our ability to put off paying for all of this until later through the means of, of debt and credit. And of course, we, we also have developed weapons of mass destruction in the form of nuclear weapons that put all, all of this on a precipice. So if that's true, if fossil fuels have played this uh, key role in the Anthropocene, uh, creating all these problems? Is it just a matter of switching to renewable energy and we can continue using the same amount of power? But of course, now it'll be green power and we can just you know, go about our lives basically the same way. Well, uh, it would be nice if that were the case, but it's really not that simple. Um, I worked for a year with um, a colleague, David Fridley, who's an uh, energy analyst at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And um, we looked at the, the possibilities and the uh, roadblocks to a, a transition to all renewable energy. And basically what we found is that uh, the only realistic pathway involves a substantial reduction in the amount of energy that we're using. We, we will need to power down uh, especially those of us who live in high energy societies like the United States, uh, by a significant amount. I mean, if you just look at our, our energy history, it's been one of adding more and more new energy supplies. 
Uh, and it, so far, it's, that's the way it's been with um, solar and wind. You know, we've added them on top of natural gas, oil, coal. Um, but we haven't really substituted them because it's, it, it's been impossible to, uh, to increase the rate of production of uh, renewable energy fast enough. And our total energy usage has continued to grow. In fact, it's grown faster than our additions of uh, solar and wind. So uh, not only do we need to substitute, we also just need to reduce the amount of energy that we're, that we're using by a very significant amount, which will, of course, have knock-on effects, source extraction and all the other things we do. Are we capable of limiting ourselves in such a way? Well, um, the the argument is usually made: No, we're not. You know, we just uh, it's it, we're inherently incapable of self limitation as as biological organisms. You know, we're subject to the maximum power principle, and human societies only want to grow. And especially, this is true of capitalism. Well, I. In the book, I, I suggest that, in fact, self-limitation is common throughout the biosphere and, uh, and human society is all through history. And, and um, the, uh, the big God religions were, all, in many ways, all about self-limitation and introducing the idea of the soul and the health of the soul is brought about through service to others and, and so on. Uh, in up in, into modern times, we have game theory looking at is nuclear dis disarmament possible? Well, yes, it is actually, and it's possible to game that out. So it's not that self limitation is impossible, but it is difficult in the current instance because of things like denial, optimism bias, uh, the Overton window, which limits you know, what, what we can talk about publicly. For example, the idea of economic growth, we just take that for granted. The idea of deliberate degrowth, that's outside the Overton window, at least in the United States. It's discussed in some European countries, but here, you know, it's just, you can't talk about it. If, if uh, Bernie Sanders or, or uh, uh, any other candidate were to, were to bring up the possibility of degrowth, it would be dis just dismissed out of hand. That's a crazy person. So um, while it is possible in principle for us to, to limit ourselves, it's going to be a, a very difficult job. And in, so into this, this is the context, okay, into which the, the current uh, pandemic is, is appearing. Uh, the con that context is a highly networked world, a global superorganism that only wants to grow with a high population density, which makes transmission of diseases uh, much more possible and rapid, and uniformity of our systems developed through globalization and um, uh, you know, spread of technologies across the, across the globe. In, in this system, uh, pandemic becomes more or less an inevitable risk. And uh, Lori Garrett wrote a book back in the 1990s called The Coming Plague, in which she very eloquently made exactly this point. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning book. And it's well worth going back and rereading, even if you have uh, that book somewhere on your shelf. She explains why uh, a disease organism like this is something we almost inevitably have to look forward to. The specific characteristics of COVID-19 are ones that um, so, sort of hit the sweet spot. You know, it's highly transmissible. And the, uh, the death rate is not too great, and, but just enough so that it's, uh, it's likely to overwhelm uh, medical systems across the globe. Uh, but then there, there's the question, is the cure, which is a, a global economic lockdown, worse than it is the disease? Because as everyone is, and as we see with the, the U.S. stock market right now, you know, when we do a lockdown of the economy, people are going to suffer just because of that, never mind the virus. Uh, just a couple of slides showing, you know, where we are right now. The uh, U.S. is way behind the curve on testing. And without testing for the virus, it's hard to know exactly 
you know, where we are, how, how far it has spread and where it is. These are the, the, the known um, points of, of infection in the U.S. now, but that's just for reference. There are uh, websites like this one. This is, this is a website that was created by a 17-year-old teenager somewhere in Washington State. And it's pretty cool because you can just see daily updated figures. But these are the confirmed cases. And uh, uh, with the limitations of testing, uh, I think it's fair to say actual cases are probably something like a an order of magnitude higher than that. Somewhere in that ballpark, nobody knows for sure. But uh, the spread at this point, especially outside of China and uh, South Korea, is exponential. And uh, when everyone talks about flattening the curve, this is what they're talking about. If we can get this down to a linear progression, then uh, even though the, the, the disease still progresses for some time, it doesn't overwhelm our uh, medical systems. Because that's where you really start to see the high fatality rate. Um, uh, in, in the countries that have been able to, to flatten the curve, the fatality rate is much lower than in the countries where the medical systems have been uh, overwhelmed. So the, the virus is, is infecting people, but it's also infecting our networked economy. And we see this in the, uh, in the oil industry, uh, what's happened over the last uh, couple of months as the coronavirus epidemic has exploded, uh, of course, China instituted a massive quarantine that, quarantine that caused oil demand to crater. So Saudi Arabia asked its OPEC partners and Russia to cut oil output to keep prices from crashing. Russia refused. So the Saudis and the Russians, Russians are in a price war now to, uh, you know, uh, each one is trying to get more market share than the other, but as a result, world oil prices have crashed, and it's the U.S. more than either Saudi Arabia or Russia that's going to be hurt by this uh, crash of, of prices. The U.S. fracking industry is in entirely responsible for the spectacular recent growth in U.S. oil production over the last 10, 12 years. And the frackers cannot afford uh, to produce oil at $30 a barrel. They, even at $50 a barrel, they were mostly losing money. And, uh, and now they're all set to go bust, unless the Trump administration bails them out, which, of course, they're talking about doing. So we are clearly at the beginning of uh, another 2008 moment. Uh, it's, it's only a question of how deep it will be and how long it will last. I wrote a book called The End of Growth. Uh, it was published in 2011 in which I argued that, you know, uh, really we, we shouldn't just be talking about uh, recession and recovery. We have to understand that economic growth as we've known it can't be kept up for much longer anyway. And so we're, we're looking for that inflection point sometime in the early half, in the first half of the 21st century. Have we reached it? Well, I think a good argument could be made, but I've, I've stopped making predictions like hard and fast predictions like that. But clearly the market was already over leveraged. leveraged. We were in a global debt bubble. All of the talk about the fundamentals are sound was really um, just to keep the markets happy. Um, we don't, know yet fully how governments and central banks are going to respond, but clearly the, the, central, the uh, Federal Reserve has already basically um, used all of its ammunition just in the last uh, two weeks. So what do they do for an encore? We don't know. I mean, there's modern monetary theory, the, guy, the idea that government can just print as much money as it needs and you know, start sending checks to uh, people at home. Uh, but, you know, e even if everybody's receiving a check for $1,000 every month from the government, for, you know, free money, helicopter money, does that mean that everybody's going to suddenly go out and, um, and go to the movies and book a cruise and, and so on? Of course not. You know, they'll use that money for bare necessities. So it's not going to, it's not going to uh, 
fuel a recovery. So nobody knows how long uh, this is going to last. And that's partly because unlike previous financial crises, this isn't just a financial problem. <clears throat> Meanwhile, um, as I talked about in, a, in a, uh, a recent blog post that you can look at at uh, uh, resilience.org, um, all of this social distancing is having a psychological and social impact on, on people's lives. We're going to see much higher rates of depression, psychological depression throughout communities, um, people um, it, it, reacting with, with anger and other, you know, um, antisocial uh, emotions to loved ones, uh, co-workers, employers, employees. Um, and the tragedy is that, you know, we were talking earlier about the, 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 the large scale global crisis of uh, uh, climate change and all the rest, which have been created by the, the, the growth of the superorganism, globalization, fossil fuels, and all of this. Well, if the solution is degrowth, getting off of fossil fuels and, and so on, well, how do, you, how do you do that in a way that doesn't provoke uh, some kind of social political crisis? Well, you do it by making people happy. You concentrate on what it, what it is that makes life satisfying and worthwhile for people, an economy of happiness, you know, gross national happiness rather than gross domestic product, which means um, moving people closer together socially, uh, focusing more on cultural events, um, more farmers markets, fewer supermarkets, and, and so on. Relocalization is a, a, an overall term for this. So that, that's the cure, but suddenly we're in a historic moment where that, that cure, that prescription doesn't work because we have to do this social distancing. Right now, the most pro-social thing we can do is stay at home because that's going to uh, reduce the, in, the infection rate and, and flatten the curve. So the question is, how can we build social connectivity while also responding to the pandemic? And I don't have a, a, you know, a, a pat answer to that. I think this is something we need to be discovering, uh, thinking about and uh, researching um, as, as we go along, those of us who are you know, looking for ways to, to move through this. Very briefly, um, my organization, Post Carbon Institute, has this website, resilience.org, if you're not familiar with it. Um, Highly recommended because uh, we're all about all this we've been discussing. Building community resilience. Community resilience is a buzzword. You hear, see the Rand Corporation here talking about it. Okay, major foundations and think tanks. But mostly they're talking about uh, building resilience in sort of a conventional sense, assuming that industrial consumer urban society is just the normal way things are and it's the way things will always be, considers mostly just climate impacts and assumes massive government effort or government leadership. What we're talking about is um, deep resilience, anticipating transformative change, uh, anticipating systematic or systemic um, impacts, not just climate, but also um, having to do with biodiversity, having to do with pandemics and, uh, and um, political, social, economic uh, uh, instability, and anticipates that governments are going to be largely overwhelmed by what's coming, and that it's it's going to be largely up to communities to build resilience and respond in ways that, that really make a difference. So that's the way we're thinking about this community resilience, because the community is kind of a sweet spot in, in the range from the individual all the way up to the, the superorganism, the global economy. It's in the community where we can um, 
meet each other face to face, hopefully again in a few months, and where um, our voice makes a difference, um, where what we do really counts. So what do we need to make resilient? It's the things that really matter in our lives, the food system, the water system, the energy system, distribution systems, and nature, biodiversity. We can never leave that off the list as so many people sort of automatically do. Um, you know, one thing we should be, one lesson we should be learning from the coronavirus is that we shouldn't be, you know, collecting and selling wild animals in markets. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and that would help at least a little bit with the biodiversity crisis. So, you know, we've already had a, a couple of years of uh, crises in Northern California. So uh, we've, we've already learned some lessons just from the wildfires, floods, and so on. In the immediate aftermath of crisis, people band together and work tirelessly and selflessly. But in the longer term, people get tired, tempers fray, and existing inequalities are, are worsened. So then it's up to those of us with a, with a longer view really to, uh, to, to maintain that pro-social response. People's first impulse is to try to get back to normal, even if it was the normal condition that precipitated the disaster in the first place. Well, the best time to build resilience is before the crisis. We don't have that luxury right now, but nevertheless, it's an important principle to remember. But above everything, build resilience in ways that reduces the source of the crisis. So aiming for sustainability. And an example of that is carbon farming. You know, as we redesign our food systems, we should be thinking about not only relocalizing them, but thinking about agriculture as a solution to climate change and uh, the biodiversity crisis and, and so on, rather than exacerbating those crises, which it's doing now, it, it, could be, it could be a solution. When you think systemically, then, then uh, solutions are, are broad range. So over the short term, we have some turbulent times to navigate. Um, and our community leaders need our support. And that support is not just saying yes, 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 but also feeding them information and, um, and helping them uh, to the extent that we can make uh, you know, reasonable decisions. Hospital workers are gonna be overwhelmed and they, in any way we can, we need to support them. As I mentioned earlier, pro-social communication is important. People are adjusting to new realities and reactions. And reactions like denial, anger, and panic are common. Don't react to other people's reactions, but try to guide conversations toward acceptance of the situation and actions that make sense for everyone. So carbon chain or supply chains are gonna be down and, and the carbon emissions down for the next few months. So that, that's good, but you know, <laughs> be careful about how you talk about that. Uh, celebrating declining carbon emissions in some circles won't be won't go over well. <laughs> um, nevertheless, it's it's what's going to happen. We've already seen it in China. And as we move to the recovery phase, um, over maybe months from now, uh, it's going to be really important to find ways to recover in a way that builds local community resilience while further reducing carbon emissions and dependency on these long just-in-time supply chains. How do we do that? Again, it's gonna be a process of discovery. A lot of people have been thinking about this for a long time, so there are some, some good ideas out there, at, and we try to feature those on, on resilience.org on a daily basis. So in a sense, you could say this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to redesign how we're living here on this planet. It's an opportunity to redesign our social relationships, our economic relationships, uh, but it's going to test us um, for a while. And uh, so that's, that's what I got. Thank you, Richard, um, very much. Yeah. That's really wonderful. And uh, I want to um, encourage uh, the 39 of us who are on the call to please uh, join Randy Hayes, who 
has just posted a question and, and add others to it. I'll start with Randy Hayes's question. Randy has been studying these issues for a long time, thought deeply about them, founder of Rainforest Action Network, and has just done so much in recent years to think about the global challenge as an interactive whole, very involved with the FAN initiative and other things. And Randy says, is it time to champion a positive great societal U-turn vision and hitch it to the coronavirus recession wagon? Self-fulfilling prophecies are what we fostered in the 90s, save the rainforest movement. While we didn't save it, we did put the issue on the global agenda and much was saved. Now we need a larger, more holistic vision to put clearly on humanity's top tier agenda. Is that your plan? Richard? Um, yeah, thanks for that, Randy. Um, and great to know that you're on the call. Uh, yeah, I think that's, um, that's exactly what we need. It may, it, it you know, it, now may be the time to be working out the, the terms of a vision like that, because I think it's still too early. People are, are still in early sort of adjustment and panic mode. Uh, but, um, I don't have a timeline for this, but in, in a while, I think perhaps people will be more ready to receive the message, and we may be more ready if we put our heads together now to uh, to put one out there. So maybe this is a good opportunity or a good time to start collaborating on uh, on messaging along those lines. Thank you for that. Uh, from Tom Cruise uh, at Rockefeller Brothers Fund in New York. Isn't the Green New Deal, in fact, an entry point for the grand narrative Randy alluded to? Yeah, it's an entry point. Um, it's it's only that though, because it still is uh, in in the uh, the mode of thinking about normal being a an industrial society based on constant economic growth. And, you know, degrowth is, is a tough message to, to sell in, uh, in North America. And I wouldn't necessarily suggest that we, we highlight it or headline it. But nevertheless, I think we have to, uh, among ourselves, as we're, as we're drafting uh, responses and messaging and so on, we have to keep it in the back of our minds that, uh, that what we're really talking about is not just a shift to, you know, wind and solar power, but a, uh, a, a fundamental rethinking of how we, how we do our economy. And so it's an entry point. And, and, um, and I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, opening up lines of communication with all of the folks who are thinking along the lines of Green New Deal could could be really useful to maybe, um, you know, strategize together. Richard, one of the things that has really fascinated me is how extremely diverse responses to uh, the coronavirus have been. So, for example, I ask everybody kind of a poll, what do you think of the coronavirus? You know, probably ask several hundred people. And I get a lot of people saying, you know, I really think it's overblown. It's not that big a deal. Um, but also, uh, if you look internationally, the polls on international opinions on the coronavirus are widely diverse among different countries and different cultures. Uh, the, the bubble that most of us live in, the kind of blue environmental social justice equity bubble, uh, we tend on many issues to be focused on fear. Uh, you know, the, th that's our kind of profession. So the Y2K thing is a perfect example of that. And of course, climate change and all the other things. So we have a, a collective bubble of fear. But uh, if you look, there was a, a study done recently of the difference between Republicans and Democrats about the uh, coronavirus. And uh, Democrats tend to be much more sure that this is going to affect somebody close to them than Republicans are. Uh, there are also tremendous personality differences, even right. within the progressives. Uh, 
people who are just characterologically optimistic tend to be optimistic. People are, who are, tend to be fearful tend to be fearful. So I'm just wondering, I mean, clearly the presentation you've done is about the science um, of where we are and the whole global challenge. But it's so easy for us to assume that everybody is in the same fear bubble that we're in, and that around the world people are looking at this. My brother and his wife just came back from Vietnam, from Hanoi, uh, on a business trip. And uh, there, uh, people, for example, when they wear a mask, they wear them in order not to be a carrier to other people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so in, in more pro-social cultures, this is held in a different way. So I guess I, the, the, what I'm getting at is, uh, as we look at our view of the science and our interpretation of it, which trends toward our collective uh, subcultural view that everything is to fear, uh, is there some possibility that we are missing other ways of holding this, uh, mm. both within our country and around the world? Right. Um, yeah. Um. It's well. First of all, um, messaging on this is is tricky because um, one doesn't want to provoke too much fear. And some people have very rational minds, and it's just tell me the facts, and I'll make the decisions accordingly. And other folks, you know, as soon as things get a little scary, it's you know emotions take over, and it's off to the races. Well, with with this situation. The, the actual facts are, you know, as, as I said earlier, it's highly transmissible. Some estimates, it's likely that uh, up to 70% of, of the global population will be infected. If it does have a 2% uh, fatality rate, then we're talking about, you know, tens of millions of uh, fatalities. But if you lead with that, you know, a lot of people just freak out and, and shut down. But that's why um, it's, this needs to be taken seriously. The, the strong likelihood is that um, someone you know um, will be not just infected, but will, will, um, will be one of those fatalities. No, I agree with that. And, and I didn't come at this from, right. as you know, for, I share your analysis deeply. I just... Right. I just am aware when I go downtown in Bolinas, uh, I'm wearing a mask when I go to the store, I'm wearing gloves and all that, but I'm alone in that. There are lots of people who are close to each other, who are walking in and out. And so just to, to hold that awareness, of course, all the people who serve social functions, the physicians, you know, my brother's an oncologist, he's sure he's yeah. going to get it. Our local physician is hoping she gets it soon so that she hopes she becomes immune so that she can go out and do her work. So there are all these different views, even within our collective bubble. But let me go to some of the other great questions we're getting here. Yeah. Uh, and I'll give you several at once. Uh, from Tom Athaneju, great talk, but entirely localist. The climate and biodiversity crises is inherent, inherently global, and we don't have a chance unless our transition visions includes a real commitment to international solidarity. We need to invest some real time and energy working on the global side of the Green New Deal. That's one, and I'll give you uh, two more. Uh, Michael Northrup, also from Rockefeller Brothers Fund, as China loses its centrality as the start point for supply chains, which is a likely impact, I think the current situation, uh, uh, in the current situation, are, are there specific recommendations for how to reform sustainable sourcing systems? Great question. And then uh, Terry Spar, and then I'll stop for now. What are your thoughts on and which do you think is easier and more effective in achieving a sustainable world? Degrowing consumption or degrowing the number of consumers? <laughs> that's a really interesting question because just to add to that, there is a hashtag among... Uh, uh, 11th, 10th and 11th graders that is trending, some of you know, 
uh, calling the virus the boomer remover. Have you heard that? So No, but I'm not at all surprised. Yeah. So the boomer remover hashtag is moving. And if you think of it, if you step back from all the human tragedies and look at this as a global ecosystem, it's always been true that pandemics and, you know, you know, other things have come through for all species and weeded out the old and the infirm and the less strong and so on and so forth. And we've assumed that we can just overcome that dynamic. So there's a level at which, which is very hard to talk about. Uh, this is n nature essentially reasserting its capacity to prune and trim Homo sapiens as a, an overgrown species. So I'll stop there. Right. Um, okay. Um, first, global action versus local action. Well, of course, it has to be both. And anyone who's involved in in uh, global work, as Tom is, go for it. You know, uh, we need to support all the Greta Thunbergs in, in the world and all the Tom Athanasius and everyone who's who's uh, uh, working to build a, a, a a global Green New Deal or a global transition away from fossil fuels. That said, um, uh, the local work is absolutely essential because uh, it's it's very possible that governments will just be uh, overwhelmed by the kinds of things that are happening right now, economic as well as as the, the pandemic. And so if we're not working at the lo local level to build alternatives and a basis for uh, maintaining a low carbon economy, then, uh, you know, there, there's no safety net. There's nothing that, there's nothing to transition to. Um, the, ch the question about China and um, uh, replacing the, the, the current uh, supply chains that, uh, Sustainable that, sourcing. That lead there with sustainable uh, sourcing. Yeah, well, this is something that, that we've been discussing for a long time at, on, uh, on transition.org. And uh, it really is all about you know, supporting local manufacturing, especially supporting local food producers. Um, is there a way to uh, make local and sustainable smartphones <laughs> Probably not. Um, and there always has been trade, and there, as long as as uh, we're a, around as an organized species, there, there almost all. I'm sure there will be uh, trade in the future. But the 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 uh, amount of long distance trade in terms of tonnage is almost certainly going to decline. So instead of uh, shipping, you know, massive amounts of raw materials and, uh, you know, clothing and food across oceans. Uh, it's, uh, we need to focus on trade of just the things that are, that are uh, easier and cheaper to, to move and, and make the rest where we are. And again, that really means supporting, supporting your local fill in the blank Degrow consumption or degrow consumers? Well, um, you know, we're adding 80 million new humans a year at the current rate of, uh, you know, births minus deaths. So uh, even in the worst case scenario, this uh, pandemic will cancel out maybe one year of population growth. Um, so I, I think we, we especially need to think about, um, uh, population, uh, uh, management in, uh, poor countries with high population growth rates, because those are the countries where, you know, many people are coming to the world who are going to have no opportunity for education, health care, and, and so on. So we need to support women's power, empowerment, and rights, and so on in those, in those countries especially. It's sort of being taken care of in the wealthy countries as a result of fast declining fertility rates, 
largely as, as a result of uh, hormone mimicking chemicals, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals in the biosphere, um, which is uh, another problem on its on its own. So, uh, in the in the race between degrowing consumption and degrowing consumers, I think all almost all of our emphasis needs to be on degrowing consumption, uh, especially in the highly consuming, um, already industrialized world. That's that's. Um, that's the first priority. Uh, Sherry Myers from the Jennifer Altman Foundation says, to help our transition to a no growth economy, we'll have to prevent the bailout of many of those industries, fossil fuels, airlines, cruises, etc., that are huge contributors to global problems. Do you know of any efforts along these lines? Uh, I think those efforts are probably just being imagined right now because <laughs> all of this is so so recent and so new. But it's going to be a, a very contentious debate, I would guess, over the next few weeks because um, there there certainly are bailouts in the works for uh, for the airlines and the, the cruise ship industry and uh, and the uh, the fracking industry. And what a waste of money. You know, these are exactly the things that need to go away. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the fracking industry can, can continue much longer on uh, even on life support. But um, certainly the, you know, the airlines have no intention of, of closing up shop and, and blowing away without, uh, you know, some effort to, to maintain themselves. It's going to be very difficult, you know, uh, over over if this lasts for months, as it uh, may well, you know, for five or six months to keep uh, those, those industries like the airline industry um, afloat when nobody's flying. Uh, I don't know how you mothball the planes and keep the, keep the employees um, um, so that the, the whole thing can be reinflated once this is over. I, I'm not sure that can happen, but um, it's, it's going to be a big discussion, and, and certainly we have a, 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 a part in that discussion. Randy Newcomb uh, asks a really interesting question. What patterns emerging now during this pandemic reflect patterns that might emerge in the mainstream in the future? That's a really interesting one. I mean, it seems to me one striking one, because you talked about food systems, is regenerative agriculture, which is already getting some mainstream play. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that, that that is one example. But what other, in other words, another way of saying that is what are the things that have been developing uh, in, uh, in innovative thinking circles that really have a chance to go big? You know, the fact that uh, Romney has joined Yang in suggesting a $1,000 you know, to every American citizen. That suggests at least that universal basic income is right. something that might, so what, are, what thoughts do you have about what areas, because particularly for um, philanthropists engaged in this, the question may be what, what, what to get behind that really has leverage. What are your well, thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I don't have a I don't have a set pat answer to that, mm -hmm. but um, you know maybe we can think think it through together. Um, there are some uh, some ideas around uh, seeding local manufacturing with uh, designs that can be implemented in you know within a local context uh, using. Uh, 3D printing technology, and uh, uh, I, I mean, you can build 3D printers with 3D printers using using designs that are passed uh, through the internet. Um, I'm actually more interested myself in uh, in low tech alternatives to uh, ways we currently do things using you know, globalized, highly industrialized, energy-intensive systems. And there's a, uh, there's 
low tech magazine, which you can find on the internet, um, uh, which is uh, the project of a, a, a Dutch energy uh, analyst working in Spain. But it's, it's, it's wonderful stuff. If you're not familiar with low tech magazine, I suggest checking it out. So, uh, yeah, the example of carbon farming, I think, is really important. Um, what are some others? Can you think of any? Uh, we'll add those as they show up here. Randy Hayes is back with this question. Is a continental network of bioregional economies where we are 90% self-reliant continentally in food, clothing, shelter, and low-impact comfort items a solid vision or too hippy-dippy? Every continent can see such a level of self-reliance. Foreign aid could be to help other continents get more self-reliant. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a that's a, a vision maybe whose whose time has come. It was uh, bioregionalism, of course, was uh, widely discussed in the 1970s and 80s, <clears throat> and maybe early 90s, and then kind of went dark during the age of, of globalization. But part of the problem we're seeing right now is with this highly networked global industrial system. Uh, if, um, if, if one of the nodes of that network like China uh, suddenly goes down, it affects the entire system. Now, if we have a, a, a more, more localized bioregional uh, um, way of organizing uh, economies. That doesn't mean we get rid of problems, uh, but we we are no longer in a situation necessarily where a problem in one place means the whole system is at risk. So it's inherently more resilient. That's that's the the, the takeaway. Um, localization is inherently more resilient than than globalization. So that's the direction we we need to be moving in. And uh, 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 I think there's a lot to be learned from the, the bioregional vision of the, of the 80s and early 90s, including there were, there were a lot of political ideas for local direct democracy that, uh, that have been uh, implemented in a few places. The, uh, the, the Kurdish people in, uh, in Syria and Turkey have been um, implementing some of those direct democracy ideas and um, and, and and quite successfully and they're, they're ready for a test drive in other places. You know, I just let me just add that I'm sure many of you are doing this also. But friends in Switzerland tell me that the Swiss government is responding responsibly and intelligently, and that people trust the government. Also, friends in Austria tell me the same thing. Uh, so there are there are countries. It's nice to remember where there's a sense of uh, of solidarity, and I think that's true in some of the, uh, some of the Asian countries, although it's more complicated. But a sense that uh, that the government is going to try to do the right thing, and and there's because there's a sense of more uh, acceptance of government guidance people are more likely to do that than we are in the United States. By the way, Randy Hayes came back when we were talking about uh, uh, opportunities that might work. Continental manufacturing of vital medicines would resonate with the mainstream right now. That could leverage right. the larger effort. That's a really interesting point. Uh, yep. Someone named XRLA says, um, do you see food shortages in the coming months? If so, how can we increase food security? Right. Uh, well, I don't, you know, I don't have a crystal ball that goes that far. But, um, you know, everyone I know who has a garden is putting in a little extra this year. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really smart to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's smart anyway, but um, uh, rationing may very well happen in terms of, of food. Certainly it's going to be happening in, in terms of medical care. We're already seeing that in, in many countries where medical care is in effect being rationed, whether it's called that or not. Uh, and so I think we'll, we're most likely going to see uh, rationing of other things as well. And rationing in most cases 
is is a good thing. It's it's uh, society figuring things out together for the good of everyone. And of course, the classic example is food rationing in Britain during and immediately after World War II. And I think it went on until something like 1954 or something like that. And people were better nourished in Britain during food rationing than they were either before or after. So, um, and there's an excellent book, which I would love to be able to hold up so you could see uh, by Stan Cox called Any Way You Slice It, which is a, a look at historical look at rationing in various societies and times through history. And we, we already are rationing a lot of things, as he points out. It's uh, the food stamp program is, is a form of rationing, for example. But um, we could be doing a lot more, and I suspect we will. Uh, Richard, you've thought a lot about peak oil and uh, how it turned out not to be what many of us anticipated it would be. Uh, and, um, and I've asked you about that before. Um, uh, and now, uh, of course, we have this glut of uh, oil descending on a, a contracting global economy. Um, and I wonder, just from the perspective of now, um, and all the experience you've had thinking out the peak oil hypothesis and uh, where it went and where we find e ourselves now, what do you see the, the future of, uh, of carbon energy being? Right. Um, well, this what we're seeing right now is a is a catastrophe for the the global oil industry. Um, certainly for the fracking industry, as uh, in the U.S. as I've said, also uh, tar sands uh, producers in Canada uh, can't make a profit at thirty dollars a barrel. Some of the speculation I've seen is that uh, world oil prices could fall into the twenties and maybe even lower. Um, and if that happens for any extended period of time, um, you know, the, the industry will be running on fumes. Couldn't happen to a nicer industry, of course. But, um, but what, does uh, it mean coal, it, what does it mean that it would be running on fumes? In other words, what do you see actually taking place? If well, yeah, I think the production would continue only where it's actually subsidized by government. And it wouldn't make sense for government to subsidize production at any higher rate than actual demand. Um, so if demand is, is cut in half, which is, which is entirely possible over the next couple of months, um, then um, even, if, if, even if government is subsidizing companies, actual production, I think, will, will decline very substantially. Because uh, there isn't that, there aren't that many places to store the stuff. You know, once all the oil tankers are filled, and uh, and the the land-based storage capacity, and it's not that much, then uh, the producers really have no no other alternative than to just shut down production. So, given that and, climate change is the elephant in the room, right? And we're talking about potentially a fifty percent decline in oil consumption, who knows, right. or whatever. Um, and we're also asking ourselves, where are the opportunities in this moment? Uh, I, wonder, uh, um, I wonder what your thinking is about where the opportunities are with respect to getting some real policy change that would affect climate change. Right. Um, well, you know, keeping production at that lower level would be enormously helpful. Um, we're heading into the summer months when carbon emissions are down uh, traditionally anyway. And now we have the added uh, impact of, of declining oil consumption for airlines and, and commuting and, and everything else. So, um, you know, what happens when we start trying to go back to a normal economy? Uh, then push, you know, that's when push comes to shove in terms of uh, our, our argument that we should continue leaving the oil in the ground. 
Um, and that's, that, that's the time when we'll be needing to have that, uh, that debate. Right. If, if we go to uh, the work that you and Asher Miller do at the Post Carbon Institute and your focus on uh, community as the sweet spot, in other words, there's local resilience, there, I mean, there's family or personal resilience, there's community resilience, there's state, national, global, however you want to count. And as you've said, you see community resilience as the sweet spot because it's the place at which we actually have agency. We, we right. know it's, it's more than personal resilience. It's less than state or national resilience. We don't necessarily have much agency at the state or national level. But at the community level, we have real agency. So how at Post Carbon do you see your messaging going forward to communities? And what are you hearing from the communities you're involved with? What is, what is the flow of information that's taking place at the Post Carbon Institute and its extraordinary website, resilience.org? Yeah. Well, what we're seeing now is um, people in our networks, people we're, we're in touch with, are engaging with their uh, local leaders um, and of course, local leaders are kind of uh, stressed and inundated right now. So one doesn't want to overload them with information. But nevertheless, um, if if it's framed in a way that's that's helpful in uh, you know aiding them in in processing what's important, what's less important, making suggestions about ways of actually solving problems. Uh, our experience is that there's there's real openness right now. Um, and our so, colleague Nate Hagens, who was on your board and is such a contributor to resilience thinking, he's been going around talking to state and local leaders and and getting a real sense of of resonance. Um, that's right. With with this message as well. Um, is there anything else on your mind that you'd like to reflect on in the last fifteen minutes we have? Any pieces that I haven't asked you about or that just come to you as particularly significant? Yeah. Well, I think tending to our own uh, personal psychological resilience is real. It's, it's always important. You know, you can't do the kind of work that, that you and I do, Michael, without, you know, taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of those, those around us. Uh, but this, this is going to be a, a, a difficult time uh, in terms of um, social isolation, provoking depression and the sense of being you know, cut off and watching things come apart at a distance and not being able to do anything about it. This is, this is a recipe for difficult times. Um, my wife Janet and I just watched a, uh, a PBS documentary made a few years ago on the American experience about the, the 1918 uh, uh, flu pandemic. And I thought, I thought that was really useful just to see how people responded. And the interesting thing about that was that um, it was almost entirely forgotten. People stopped talking. About, once it was over, people just stopped talking about it. It's not that they the, the memory wasn't there, but you know the country went into the roaring twenties, uh, and um, so that that tells you something about how we how we respond to these these kinds of things. We 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 try to deny as much as possible, and then and then we we try not to learn from it either. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, go ahead. You know. A few things have occurred to me. One is um, I'm thinking of writing something called the the pandemic of loneliness, yeah. because um, you know, for example, when they shut off nursing homes to all outside visitors, they may stop people from dying of the flu, but people will die of loneliness. You know, right. that's that's a real fact, and so there will be there will be many people in the social isolation thing for whom uh, the pandemic of loneliness, you know, Mother Teresa said loneliness is the great poverty of the West. 
And so there, there are many people for whom that's going to be a real issue. Um, the other thing that's really striking to me is the only collective message is wash your hands, social distance, you know, good hygiene, uh, shelter in place, uh, everything else. There is no discussion, because I've spent uh, 40 years in integrative health, of all the things you can do to increase personal and family resilience. Right. I mean, starting with, you know, good sleep, stress reduction, exercise, you know, just uh, uh, there's like we, we have a list of seven uh, of these things. But also on top of that, there's no discussion of responsible nutritional and herbal supplementation, which is science based or science informed. And that's very active on the Internet, people trying to figure those pieces out. So it's just fascinating to me that we rely exclusively on the sanitation things and no discussion at all of personal and family and community intensive health promotion and, and what it means to create community in a meaningful way that overcomes the social distancing thing. Uh, as well as herbal and nutritional supplementation. I mean, I have thought about uh, gathering people at Commonweal with six-foot lengths of rope so that we can form circles that we hold different ends of the rope and be together, or just leading, you know, walking tours of people where we stay a distance apart. Just all the creative ways that we can overcome social isol isolation and be careful and it seems to me that when we think about community resilience, that messaging about those kinds of things, as well as all the good things about, you know, uh, you know uh, gardens and everything else, should really be part of what we are offering people. Right. Yeah, um, I've, I've seen this discussion of vitamin C and vitamin D as being, being important uh, nutritionally. I think getting out in nature is something we can still do. I mean, it's, that's, yeah. there's, there's no reason. Uh, nature is not trying to infect us <laughs> per se. It's only, you know, via uh, social contact, close contact with other, other human beings. And how can we maintain contact without being physically close? I mean, we do have, at least for now, these, these tools of, uh, social media, the internet, of course, we're, we're doing this, this discussion right now in cyberspace. Last night, my wife, Janet, and I uh, called up uh, some friends of ours uh, that we often meet with on Sunday evenings. And rather than getting together in person, we chose a, a short movie to watch together. Mm. And so they, they were streaming it in their house. We were streaming it in our house. And then we got back on the phone afterward and talked about it. And um, it wasn't quite like being together, but it, it sure was a heck of a lot better than, than not having that contact. Yeah. So we can be imaginative. We have two more great questions from Michael Northrup and Tom Cruise. Uh, Michael Northrup, uh, following on Michael's question, Richard, do you have an agenda of recommendations for local governments? Cities are well organized and quite open-minded on these issues more so than other levels of government. They are also the frontline responders for COVID-19. Can we use this openness to help them marshal the big transition we need? It may be a good time to develop and share those recommendations. That's one. Mm -hmm. And from Tom Cruise, uh, a thought from Barry Lynn, the jump from current highly concentrated and interconnected systems to localization is huge. There will be intermediate steps Already the airlines are asking 50 billion. Lynn argues for bailouts of key industries, which will happen, but in a way that puts us on a path to break up monopolies and redistribute industrial dependencies. I mention this to begin to imagine the kinds of policy fights we will face. Those are both really beautiful questions. Thoughts yeah, they are. Those? And, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't have... The, the almost more comments than questions. I, I wish we had a set of, of uh, you know, recommendations for local leaders, and, and that's a great idea. I think we, you know, I, I'm going to make it, put it on my to-do list this week to, to start filling, filling yeah. that in. 
And uh, what about the, the Barry Lynn uh, point about, uh, you know, uh, the bailout of key industries in a way that puts us on a path to break up monopolies and redistribute industrial dependencies? Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, breaking up industries takes, takes capital, too. So um, is $50 billion enough money to uh, pay for mothballing all those airliners and and uh, retraining the uh, <laughs> all those, uh, I'm sure, hundreds of thousands of, of workers, maybe. Mm-hmm. You know, it would be better to do that than, yeah. than just, uh, you know, recapitalizing the, the, the corporations themselves. Mm. Richard, as we last five minutes or so, uh, I found that when I read in this field that you have read everything before I got there. And um, so if you were to offer uh, a short list of, I don't know what, three to five authors whose uh, work you find particularly seminal in this field, who would you name? Oh, gosh. You know, um, it, let's see. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mentioned Peter Turchin. Uh, he, he has several books that are really helpful for understanding uh, societal evolution. Mm-hmm. Um, so when, going back to the discussion at the beginning of our um, thing, um, somebody who, a couple, a couple of authors that I find really, really helpful and interesting, William Ophuls. Uh, yeah. I have several of his books here. Terrific writer, and these are very small books. Would you name his his book? We can't quite see it. Uh, This one's called Apologies to the Grandchildren, with Reflections on Our Ecological Predicament, Its Mm -hmm. Deeper Causes, and Mm -hmm. Its Political Consequences. I wouldn't necessarily recommend starting with this one, but this is just the one that came to hand. And then uh, David Fleming, um, who's no longer with us, British... uh, uh, I guess he was trained as an economist, but uh, um, a great ecological thinker. And and uh, his book, Surviving the Future, I think is must-reading in these times. And it, it talks about the, the transition, you know, away from fossil fuels to whatever is next, not just in technical terms, but in real human terms about how, how much we've lost in terms of, of community vitality and celebration and and so on uh, in, in building our, our modern economy and how in transitioning to what's next, we need to recover all of that um, richness and beauty that we traded away. And I actually, I make that point in the last chapter of, uh, of my book, Power, as well, that um, we, in addition to being power junkies, we're, we humans are also beauty junkies, but the kind of beauty that the industrial system has fostered is uh, is is kind of a a, a sad uh, <laughs> uh, counterfeit of the beauty that we human beings really are capable of, and and as we move away from the employment economy where we're all just useful cogs in the great wheels of industry. Um, we should be imagining, you know, what life can be like if we're if we're turning our attention on, and our efforts on a daily basis toward making life happier and more beautiful for ourselves and for our communities. The, the possibilities are endless, and there are plenty to keep us engaged for many, many generations to come. And how beautiful life could be if that were our main focus. I. I completely second your recommendation of uh, David Fleming's work. And in addition to Surviving the Future, his, his masterpiece from which Surviving the Future derives called Lean Logic. And there it is right there. And, and um, Richard, you've said you keep it nearby and your quote about it is extraordinary. But he really is a truly seminal thinker. And so right. I do agree if people take no other single recommendation from this in terms of books that Fleming's work, he was a founder of the Green Party, I believe, in, in the UK. He's right. an absolutely seminal figure to that whole cluster uh, in the UK of uh, the transition towns movement, 
of uh, Jem Bendel and deep adaptation of um, uh, the Dark Mountain Project. Um, there's a whole cluster of really creative thinking on this in the UK. Uh, and uh, it's sort of joined in a tenuous but real way with a cluster of those in, of us in the US and in other countries that are trying to rebuild a, a resilience movement based not on any single issue like climate change alone, but the interactive effect of several dozen stressors that have created this bottleneck for all of biodiversity from which only a portion of biodiversity and humanity will emerge. And how can we do whatever we can to save what is useful and rebuild and create resilience? So that is the task for NGOs, for funders, for all of us who are thinking about this. And what a wonderful way to begin our seminar series on this work uh, with you, Richard. Uh, we are deeply, deeply grateful to you, and we will be back in touch with any of you. If you want, uh, if you're in the extended funder community and want to join us, uh, the website is omega.ngo, and we'll put you on our mailing list. And if you want to join our effort to raise the NGO community up, uh, we have resilienceproject.ngo where we feature the work of many uh, colleagues who are doing extraordinary work, of which the Post Carbon Institute and resilience.org is really one of uh, the, the high points. So again, Richard, thank you and thank the 36 participants on this call who stayed with us for uh, 90 minutes. So there must be some interesting people. Uh, so. Uh, we're deeply grateful to you. And, and thank you, Michael, for your wonderful work uh, over these many years of such, uh, such compassion and uh, wisdom. And uh, it's just a, a, a pleasure and a delight and an honor to, to work with you. The honor is deeply mutual and the honor with all of those who've joined us on this call. Thank you all. Yeah.